in the Netherlands, about 23% of the species are fungi. Of course, a species on your own, uh, independent on how well you have showered or washed yourself this morning, you're an whole ecosystem and that's why you're healthy. So species on their, on, their, on their own are nothing. It's really about networks. And nature is the ultimate networker, I think. And somebody who knows a lot about that is our next speaker, Toby Kiers, who is professor of evolutionary biology at, uh, at the Free University of Amsterdam. Toby has worked a lot on fungal networks, has also started, how crazy can you be, the Society for the Protection of Underground Networks. I want to say two things about the talk today, two really important take-home messages, that there's just as much to learn below our feet, and we're calling those people underground astronauts. We're getting a little bit less funding than space people, but there's still so much to discover. We have to remember that biodiversity is more than cataloging species. One of the key things in, I think, understanding biodiversity is understanding the strategies that underlie this biodiversity. So this is a living arbuscular mycorrhizal network. This network is moving resources. These strategies, this movement is under fungal control. And you see how complex it is. It moves one direction, it moves another, it changes directions. And understanding these strategies is really paramount. And so that's what we're trying to do in our group, is understand this language of flows. These are symbiotic fungal networks. So what they do is they're exchanging carbon that they get from root systems for phosphorus that the fungi are foraging for in the soil. There's billions of these hyphae under an acre of forest. And there's tens of billions of these hyphae under an acre of grassland. So they are incredibly, incredibly vast. So anywhere between 30 and 50% of the living biomass of these soils is these arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. So when you think about it, it's up to about 80% of the phosphorus in plants is provided by these fungal networks. Our, our own DNA, human DNA, is mostly made out of phosphorus that first passed through a fungal network. Our lab is interested in trying to track resource exchange between plants and fungi, quantify how much of that resources are exchanged, and then predict. We're removing from a very old sort of paradigm of microbial behavior as sort of standalone asocial organisms to microbes as social actors, right, performing very complex behaviors. So we're really interested in trying to understand how information across these fungal networks, how it's processed and how it's shared, and how that leads to different strategies across different types of fungal networks. It has to create an infrastructure to actually go out in the soil and collect resources. Next, it has to evaluate where you would actually transport those resources for trade. And next, it has to collect payment for those resources to get a good price. Now, the problem is that we've been very focused on looking at fungal networks in a laboratory setting. And what that means is that we don't really understand the context of trade, right? Trade strategies are predicted to shift, even if there's just a small change in, let's say, available resources in the soil. Bringing up that type of complexity is, is very difficult, right? We don't understand the chemical, the physical, the environmental stimuli that's actually mediating these trade strategies. So this is what we're trying to understand, is this trade for, for carbon to phosphorus, and you've got the plant root on one side and the fungal network on the other, and they've been doing this for 450 million, I get shivers thinking, 450 50 million years. What's important about to know about these networks is that they're called obligate biotrophs, right? It's a big word, but basically it just means that they, they rely on their host plant for all of their carbon, their sugars and their fats. And the next sort of technique that we have been working with is, um, is a technology called quantum dots. And we can tag those quantum dots onto resources like apatite, which is a rock form of phosphate. And what this allows us to do is actually then study how resources are moved across the network. We can add the different colors at different times, or we can add the colors at different places in space. And then we can first, for the first time, you know, sitting at that poker table, kind of understand the strategies. So we found that fungi are very good at discriminating among plant roots, right? They can tell a plant that's giving them lots of carbon versus one that's giving them very few carbon. When you reward fungi with carbon, this triggers more cooperation. One of the sort of the most interesting ideas is this, this, this hypothesis that fungi can actually restrict the autonomy of root systems. The fungi can get into a root system and actually 
actually downregulate the ability of the plant's own nutrient transporters to take up resources from the environment. So basically hijacking the plant's own nutrient uptake system. But that works perfectly for the fungi because then they're, they're getting plenty of carbon and the plant becomes even more dependent on the fungi. Fungi can move resources to increase their value. We were creating hot, um, rich patches and poor patches and then studying how the fungi was taking up those resources and moving them across the network to places where plant demand was higher and they could get a higher price. The fungi can actually hoard resources. And this is a brilliant, hoarding is a brilliant evolutionary strategy, right, by any, by any organism. This idea that fungi can take up resources into their network, store it until resource levels outside the network become quite low, and then exchange it. You can play with the relatedness of fungal networks and how that can change the strategies of the fungi and how much resources they give to the host root. We tried to make these uh, fungal networks that varied in how related they were. So imagine you had two root systems and then you had a connecting, joining fungal network in a center compartment. And then within that compartment, we, we played around with, with which fungal network was me meeting with other fungal networks. When they were not related, the fungi tended to put much more energy into this extra radical growth. They were growing bigger networks when they were with non-relatives. The network, when it was with its relatives, that's when you found a higher amount of phosphorus being transferred to this fungal network. What do the fungi get out of connecting different plant roots? What do they get across? What do they, how do they benefit from moving these allochemicals that plants are exchanging underground? You see these architectures that have to do all of these different tasks, all of these different traits. And so what we're doing is actually trying to make sense of those architectures and ask, are they adaptive under different, under different contexts? We have been building this imaging robot that is sort of changing the way that we see fungal topology because what it's able to do is take these really high resolution images about every four hours. And so what you can do is you can set up different treatments for these fungi and see how they react to it. What we do then is extract the network and then start to follow it over time. Stitch all of these images together to actually follow a network over time and start to understand the kind of rules that govern how a network moves across space and time. Because we're working with biophysicists, they wanna follow every single node in space and see how that changes. And actually this is really getting at this underlying behavior, how fungi are moving across the landscape and, and, and how they react to different challenges. Are there any bigger take home messages about how the fungi explore space? What we're finding is that they're different from bacteria. And not only are fungi different, but symbiotic fungi are different. They're different than free living fungi. They seem to follow different rules. Can we quantify the topology of these networks over time? Is there a trade off between the way they extract resources and how they explore space? This is a graph you made of something called a traveling wave dynamic. As the front of the fungi moves forward, it does not grow behind it to a higher density. It's building much more of an infrastructure and not going back and growing exponentially. They seem to be prioritizing exploration for new trade sites. It has some sense of its limits, and it's using this network to build a topology that can move resources between hubs rather than concentrating on extracting resources from a specific place in space and time. And if you have, understand this topology of a fungal network, what does it look like inside that fungal network? And we see, we're starting to see speeds that reach really high levels, hundreds of microns per second at the, as this as this traveling wave starts to form. We also see very simple flows of bi-directionality. The fungi, they have to move, be moving carbon in one direction and phosphorus in the other. But exactly how they do that is still completely unknown to scientists. So somehow they are separating these resource streams 
without any sort of barrier, no physical barrier that breaks it down, self-organizing these waves of resources. There are lots of disciplines are quite interested in this question of how they're actually able to do this, how they're using these flows to move the resources in a way that not only allow them to extract the resources and trade it with the root, but get a fair price in the sense that they are essentially calculating across the entire network where to move the resources. What's happening with individual particles inside this network? We can start extracting different velocities of different particles. And now really the frontier, I would say, is trying to label those individual particles. Right now we're just calling them cellular contents, right? It's so complex inside these networks, it's very hard to sort of separate out all of the different cellular components. So that's sort of the next step.